Part eight of The Good Soldier, a selection of soldiers' letters, 1914-1918, edited by N. P. Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. French Schoolboy French boys, fine of face, raised by your mothers, who from babyhood had slow and serious growth in your large houses enclosed in leafy gardens boys religious as i was from childhood taught to assist the priest and help in conducting the mass older you left intelligent mother and wise father and came to complete in paris the growth of your spirit you have sense and pleasing manners politeness and warmth latin and geometry you knew and combining things respected from childhood and those learned in college religious boys much troubled by your studies at twenty years strangely you try to reconcile old beliefs with your new uncertainty henri franck quoted in young france and new america by pierre de la Neuve the devandre mama letter is written by a french schoolboy to the head of his school it is characteristically french in the charming intimacy it reveals existing between the cher monsieur l'abbe and his pupil in its ardent and high spirit and above all in its pretty gallic conceit of defending mama letter of french schoolboy cher monsieur l'abbe listen to this i offer myself as an english german interpreter the second day of the war knowing how to shoot to ride horseback and the bicycle and motorcycle and to drive a car and do fifty kilometers on foot if necessary i expect to be accepted they refuse me for lack of place they have enough to do with the mobilization it seems comenas being in danger i take mamma to england as well as my little sister on my return here am i stuck you see i should like so much to go to the war i would like to have offered myself a second time perhaps they would have taken me jean is at saint astier where he is in training and i do nothing once getting into a company i could have asked to go to the front it would be so fine to make one of those bayonet charges that the germans fear so much and if necessary to die at nineteen for france if i do not get in the war i would never dare to show myself again at the school what would my friends say on learning that i had not shared the danger that i have not rushed to defend mamma as regnault said in seventy oh how i envy those who fight who are wounded who die why in the devil didn't they accept me at once cited by la roche school william m barber in the log-book as it is called of the american ambulance service is a letter written by william m barber of toledo ohio who went to france in may nineteen sixteen and was wounded and received the medaille militaire his letter is we may flatter ourselves characteristically american it is boyish and enthusiastic everything is fine everyone is wonderful the ambulance driver is a great boy the doctors and the hospital are the best in the world he is very happy and his spirits are high too as we may well believe letter of william m barber france june thirty nineteen sixteen dearest folks at home abroad and grandma my three soldiers were killed i was hurt only a little i am not disfigured in any way it just tore my side and legs a bit the French treated me wonderfully. I succeeded in getting the next American ambulance driven by Wheeler, a great boy, who took me to the city of Blank, where our post is. Here I was given first aid, and the médecin chef personally conducted me in an American ambulance in the middle of the night to a very good hospital. They say I have the best doctor in France in Paris. Well, I woke up the next day in bed and have been recuperating ever since everyone is wonderful to me general pétain second to joffre has stopped in to shake hands with me and congratulate me too for above my bed hangs the medaille militaire the greatest honor the french can give any one really i am proud although i don't deserve it any more than the rest please excuse my egotism 
Mr. Hill and my French lieutenant come to see me every day, and some of the boys also. They joke around here, saying that I am getting so well that they have lost interest in me and must move on. In three or four days I go to the hospital at Neuilly, where I can have every comfort. Of course you won't worry about me. I will be just as good as new soon, and really this is true. The Germans peppered the life out of my car. No one goes on the road in the daylight, but the fellows brought me back the next day a handful of bullets taken from it, and said they could get me a bushel more if I desired them. For three days I was not allowed to eat or drink, and could hardly move in bed. My spirits were high, too. I will try to write better and take more pains. Well, here I am at Neuilly. This is a wonderful hospital, and they do treat you great. The doctors are the best in the world. I am very happy here, and hope that every day you are as happy, and never worry about me. I surely have given you a lot of trouble and anxiety. The best of my experience is that I never once regretted the great trip, and I think I have done a small part of a great work, and my medaille shows what the French think of my services. Goodbye, William. Vive l'Alsace! Some young soldiers fight for Mamma, and others for grandmother and grandfather. The latter are the descendants of the five hundred thousand exiles from Alsace and Lorraine. The cynical Bismarck said he did not take the provinces for their beaux yeux alone, but it is of the beaux yeux of the fair land that the young French crusaders seem to think, more than of any ore deposits. It is to avenge grandmother and grandfather, and to win back for Mamma her lost patrie. The following anonymous letter is quoted by Monsieur Ernest Dautet. Vive la cesse letter. My little mother. I am writing to you again to ask for news of you. I have already written to you, but I do not know if you have received my letter. I am glad to have had a little rest to recover my strength, for we are departing for blank. I am going to see again my native village, tread the soil of my second country. I shall avenge grandmother and grandfather, and I shall kill as many Prussians as possible. I have already killed my share, but it is not yet enough. Finally, it is necessary to hope that our dear Alsace, your country, will return to us, and that it is I, your son, who will contribute a little towards its recovery. I have already had many comrades, true friends, killed at my side. I have only been wounded in the arm. I am lucky. I have absolute confidence that I shall see you again, for I have a lucky star that shines over me. Little mother, do not worry. If you could only hear how the cannon thunder, one sings in order to deaden the dreadful noise. Never has my tenor voice served me so well. At the sound of the charge there are no longer men, there are spectres. Half fall dead with their horses, one mounts the other horses, and it is all the time like that. The firing is terrible, but one pays no attention to it. In the morning one is a brother in arms, in the evening one mounts the phantoms in order to rush upon the enemy. Finally have confidence and in a near victory, and vive la France, and vive la Cesse, which will soon be French. Maurice Genevois Maurice Genevois was a second-year student in the École Normale in Paris in 1914. He had just completed a study on Maupassant and was looking forward to his holidays. Within a month he was at the front and had received his baptism of fire in the Battle of the Marne. His day-by-day -day record of his experiences gives a vivid, impressionistic, cinematographic picture of modern warfare. The author of Under Fire might have gone to his young countrymen for some of his masterly pages, but hardly for the human, kindly portrait of the poilu. Letter of Maurice Genevois Several times I walked up and down, passing and repassing soldiers still hustling one another in their endeavors to read the announcements. Strangely alike in appearance were they. The faces of one and all were mud-stained, and bristles filled the hollows of their cheeks. Their blue greatcoats bore traces of the dust of the road, of the mud, of the fields, of the heavy rain. 
Their boots and gaiters had long since acquired a permanently somber color. Their clothes were worn and torn, at knees and elbows, and from their tattered sleeves protruded hands incredibly dirty and hardened. Most of them appeared wearied and wretched beyond description. Nevertheless, these were the men who had just fought with superhuman energy, who had proved themselves stronger than German bullets and bayonets. These men were the conquerors. Tomorrow, perhaps, they must once again take up their knapsacks and go marching for hours, despite feet that swell and burn. Sleep beside ditches full of water, eating only when occasion presents, knowing hunger sometimes and thirst and coldness. They will go on, and among them not one will be found to grumble at the life before them. And when the hour sounds to fight once again, they will shoulder their rifles with the same easy indifference, will rush forward as eagerly between the bursts of enemy fire, will display the same tenacity before the mightiest efforts of the enemy. For in them dwell souls ever scornful of weakness, strengthened and fortified by physical pain and weariness. O oh, all of you, my brothers in arms, we are going to do still better than we have already done, are we not? R. Derby Holmes Corporal R. Derby Holmes is a Yankee. He enlisted with the British Army early in 1916. He went over on a horse boat. He saw some hard fighting, had some harrowing experiences, and received his blighty. But all the suffering and all the experiences are as nothing, he says, compared with the satisfaction of having done a bit in the great and just cause. Corporal Holmes describes one of the ugliest incidents of the war, an incident which is said to explain the particular ferocity of the Canadians. Most stories of crucifixions are second-hand, but this Yankee's is direct. He prefaces his story by telling of a Canadian he encountered one night when crawling around on patrol in no man's land. They lay together in the mud for a time and compared notes, and then parted, each returning, supposedly, to his own trench. A little later, however, Corporal Holmes saw the Canadians going over their top. There had been no preliminary barrage and apparently no order to charge. Letter of R. Derby Holmes well, there they were, going over as many as two hundred of them, growling. They swept across no man's land and into the Bosch trench. There was the deuce of a ruckus over there for maybe two minutes, and then back they came, carrying something. Strangely enough, there had been no machine-gun fire turned on them as they crossed, nor was there as they returned. They had cleaned that German trench, and they brought back the body of a man, nailed to a rude crucifix the thing was more like a t than a cross it was made of planks perhaps two by five and the man was spiked on by his hands and feet across the abdomen he was riddled with bullets and again with another row higher up near his chest the man was the sergeant i had talked to earlier in the night what had happened was this he had no doubt been taken by a german patrol Probably he had refused to answer questions. Perhaps he had insulted an officer. They had crucified him and held him up above the parapet. With the first light, his own comrades had naturally opened up on the thing with the Lewises, not knowing what it was. When it got lighter and they recognized the hellish thing that had been done to one of their men, they went over. Nothing in the world could have stopped them. The Canadians were reprimanded for going over without orders but they were not punished, for their officers went with them, led them. Alexander McClintock Alexander McClintock has a distinguished conduct medal. The English king visited the American in the hospital and thanked him personally for his part in the engagement on the Somme, which left him with twenty-two pieces of shrapnel in his leg. For a time it looked as if he would not be able to give one interpretation to R.I.P., rise if possible. Alexander McClintock is a Kentuckian, and at one time was a ball player, and turned to bombs naturally, and even affectionately, and he fought with the Canadians in Flanders, a combination hard to beat. After the third fight at Ypres, when forty per cent of the Canadians were wiped out, and there was a call for three hundred volunteers, Mr. McClintock and a comrade started for headquarters. 
They expected to be received with applause, as he mock heroically says, and to be praised for their bravery. But they couldn't even get near enough to hand in their names. The whole battalion had gone ahead of us. That was the spirit of the Canadians. Letter of Alexander McClintock I was informed before my departure from England that a commission as lieutenant in the Canadian forces awaited my return from furlough, and I had every intention of going back to accept it. But since I got to America, things have happened. Now it's the army of Uncle Sam for mine. It's going to be a tough game, and a bloody one, and a sorrowful one for many, but it's up to us to save the issue where it's mostly right on one side and all wrong on the other and I'm glad we're in. I'm not willing to quit soldiering now, but will be when we get through with this. When we finish up with this, there won't be any necessity for soldiering. The world will be free of war for a long, long time, and a God's mercy, that. Robert Reeser Robert Reeser, the son of an artist, was himself studying art in New York when he joined the ambulance unit formed by the City Club of New York and sailed for France in July 1917. Robert is 19. He is tall. It is not easy for him to hide in shell holes, and, scared as he is, he says he cannot help laughing at the way I am imitating that well-known bird that sticks its head in the sand and feels hidden. Just before leaving for the front, Robert wrote to his parents, By tomorrow or the next day, at least, I expect we shall be at the place we started for just three months ago yesterday. You can imagine there is a good deal of conjecture as to what things will be like, and of course we are all laughing and kidding each other, and wondering how we shall conduct ourselves under fire. Jay says that on the day after the first shell burst near the convoy, the newspaper of some town in the south of France will have the report, a number of ambulances were reported to have passed through the city at 5.15 this morning, traveling south. Three wheels are known to have been touching the ground. But it is not long before Robert is sending word that little brother is having the time of his life. I'm actually reveling in driving a bucking Ford over the worst shell-swept roads in France, and I guess I'm doing it as well as the rest of the crowd. He has been cited for bravery. In one of his letters, Robert describes the roads. Letter of Robert Reeser All this time the look of the country was changing from the somewhat green fields and shattered buildings gradually to the most utterly desolate stretches of ground that I've ever laid eyes on. The roads wind up and down over small hills, which are moderately steep, and whose tops are several hundred yards apart, sometimes half a mile. And on these hills there is absolutely nothing visible, except upturned earth and rocks, the latter all shattered to tiny pieces, no stumps of trees even to break the monotony, and a good share of the time not a living thing visible, except hundreds of rats scampering around over the road. It reminds me of the heaps of ashes I've seen after big fires without any of the ruins. Of course, on closer view, remains of wagons and guns and all the things used in making war, even to horses and men, are scattered around and mixed in with the churned-up earth. On bright days, the middle distances look like the pictures of Arizona and New Mexico deserts, the same coloring and shapes in the hills. It is always picturesque and romantic, and only gruesome when you stop to think, which I do as little as possible, or when you have to pass an occasional disagreeable obstruction in the road. Arthur Guy Impey Sergeant Arthur Guy Impey confesses that while he was serving with the British Army, he was more than once punished, put on the crime sheet as it is called, and generally for a Yankee impudence. When he first went over to London and a British recruiting officer hailed him, I say, Mike, want the tyke on? His reply was that he didn't know what it was, but he rather thought he would take a chance at it. And he did. He had eighteen months of it, and there were many times when he wished he were safe home again in the little old town back of the Statue of Liberty in Jersey, no less. But he saw it through, and then with his blighty came back and told us all about it. There are doubtless some who think that this impudent Yankee invented over the top. At least he made it a familiar household phrase in America, 
a phrase that even the cats of the country came to know as mark twain said of du bist wie eine blume sergeant empey also wrote a tommy's dictionary from as original a slant as dr sam johnson's when he defined oats as a food for horses and scotchmen many of us were first initiated by empey into the mysteries of cooties and blighty and dixies which must be cleaned with mud and much besides that v c for example stands for very careless with his life and r i p for rest in pieces sergeant empey was responsible for a lot of americans taking a chance at it and going over the top if not actually at least with their money and flaming sympathies his message is earnest letter of arthur guy empey after my discharge and after a stormy trip across the atlantic one momentous day at the haze of the early dawn i saw the statue of liberty looming over the port rail and i wondered if ever again i would go over the top with the best of luck and give em hell and even then though it may seem strange i was really sorry not to be back in the trenches with my mates war is not a pink tea but in a worthwhile cause like ours mud rats cooties shells wounds or death itself are far outweighed by the deep sense of satisfaction felt by the man who does his bit there is one thing which my experience taught me that might help the boy who may have to go it is this anticipation is far worse than realization in civil life a man stands in awe of the man above him wonders how he could ever fill his job when the time comes he rises to the occasion is up and at it and is surprised to find how much more easily than he anticipated he fills his responsibilities it is really so out there he has nerve for the hardships the interest of the work grips him he finds relief in the fun and comradeship of the trenches and wins that best sort of happiness that comes with duty done the good soldier monsieur victor giraud quotes the following letter it was written by a young instructor to his father before going into an attack in which he lost his life his name is millevier wherever the names of these heroes are known they should be written down the letter expresses the spirit of the good soldier alan seeger's good soldier for whom death holds no terrors the letter also expresses simply and movingly the intimate and friendly relations existing between the officers and men especially in the french army between my general and his children letter of the good soldier the general arrived this morning he spoke to our men against all discipline our soldiers applauded him bravo my general we'll get them my general you can depend upon us the general with wet eyes went away stammering au revoir my children thank you my children i had tears in my eyes oh it is fine it is beautiful and i think that he will be satisfied with us our general our men in spite of forty days of the greatest strain have a superb morale father i am calm before going into action i shall have complete control of myself if i fall you can be tranquil i shall have had the death of a good soldier and you can think of me with a serene spirit if i fall i shall fall facing them without complaint in full consciousness of my strength of the clearness of my mind of my free will the war that we are fighting is worth dying for pages actuelles from the french with two current events from american newspapers letter of a french mother sir thank you most sincerely for the letter that you have been good enough to write me thanks especially for the pains you have taken to tell me with so much delicate consideration the terrible news which crushes me in this dreadful calamity one great consolation is left to me for seventeen years i have fought for my son's life through all sorts of illnesses i was able to rescue him from death only by the most constant care i am very proud to have succeeded in saving his life in order to permit him to die for his country this is my great consolation printed in the paris temps letter of an american mother 
allow me as one who has lived until now an old woman to express to you my thanks and appreciation for your many courtesies to me as a mother of sergeant major william b jenkins i had hoped my boy would get his chance in france but it was not to be so i am as submissive to his death as if he had died in the trenches in europe please accept my thanks for all your kindness and to any of his comrades that were with him in his sickness with a sad heart i dictate these lines but with a quickening pulse and an accelerated being i look forward to the day when victory shall come to the brave boys who are giving their lives for our beloved land i shall ever love a soldier boy may god's blessing be on you posted at camp upton training camp at yampec new york farewell of a french soldier dear godfather and godmother i write to you in order not to kill mother whom a similar blow would surprise too much i was wounded september twenty nine at saint hilaire le grand i have two hideous wounds and i shall not last very long they do not even conceal it from me i go without regret with the consciousness of having done my duty advise my parents then the best way you know how tell them not to try to come to sweep they surely would not be in time adieu dear godfather dear godmother dear parents dear cousins all you whom i have loved vive la france l bouny printed in the paris temps farewell of an american soldier mother dear as we are all ready to go just waiting for the word to set us in motion your old pal wants to say adios to you alone we have been good pals and have liked the same things and now for the time being we are separated but mother dear it will only be for a little while and i will be back with you again i will try to be a credit to you i will never be a coward to bring disgrace to you good-bye mother god keep you safe Mick McHenry, printed in the Des Moines, Iowa Register and Leader. A Lament We who are left, how shall we look again happily on the sun or feel the rain without remembering how they who went ungrudgingly and spent their all for us loved too the sun and rain? A bird among the rain-wet lilac sings, but we how shall we turn to little things and listen to the birds and winds and streams made holy by their dreams nor feel the heartbreak in the heart of things wilfred gibson end of part 8 end of the good soldier a selection of soldiers letters 1914-1918 edited by n p dawson